Um, I'll start with a few questions that I have, and then we have time for audience questions. I'm sure there'll be many. Um, the film is dedicated to the memory of Jean-Claude Carrière, who was one of the greatest um, scriptwriters, creative presences in the history of film. I saw that the story is by yourself, the screenplay is by Shoja Ajari and Jean-Claude Carrière. So this is clearly a very intimate collaboration with Carrière in what turned out to be the last moment, the last months of his life. Maybe you could speak a bit about how that collaboration came about and when you're directing a script on jo of Jean-Claude Carrière, it must feel like you're dealing with sort of holy texts. Do you feel that you have the freedom to make changes? First of all, I want to say that this is the second time I see the film with the audience. I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but thank you uh, for sitting through. Um, I um, made uh, about 111 photographs and two video installations in 2019 with the same title of Land of Dreams. And the concept was always that an Iranian woman photographer was going door to door, um, taking portraits of Americans and collecting their dreams. And that became my main concept and obsession. And Jean-Claude, uh, someone who I'd met through uh, friends uh, who's worked uh, with Bonuel and many people and his uh, sensibility for surrealism, absurdity, unbelievability, while the, the ideas were politically charged and highly potent. Um, so I, I proposed it to him and he said, I like this. Um, so we went to Paris a few times, several times, and he turned the concept into a script and he created ultimately the character of Mark and Alan. So essentially, I came up with the bone structure of the idea, which was really based on my own experience as a photographer, an obsession about creating a portrait of America, and an and, and obsession with dreams, and what that entailed, and what that meant to me. But Jean-Claude turned it into a script that was had the beginning, middle, and the end, and added the character of Mark and Alan, which in many ways were very symbolic uh, in the way that I think they represented two different aspects of American identity. The modern cowboy, mm -hmm. macho, you know, the kind of the arrogance of the superiority of America, and yet Mark being this sort of modern hippie. Uh, and so I think that was the creation of Jean-Claude. And, and then we, uh, unfortunately, he started to be more ill and so but he worked on three different drafts and then uh, we finished shooting the film as he passed away yeah. um, as you mentioned that the, the characters of Mark and Alan are symbolic or the word that I was thinking because I watched it with the audience there was there is an element of iconic iconography um, especially Alan character you know this is very you know the dress the way that you carry yourself I was thinking of Robert Mitchum at certain moments in the film uh, and this is an American iconic sort of presence. And of course, we have in the role an iconic actor. So that was a nice coming together. The question I wanted to ask you, Matt, was you're, you're playing this sort of presence which, which has iconic elements, but you have to make him a human. You have to make him a person and a character. And what were the choices that went allowed you to, to bring the humanity out of an iconic persona? Um, well, uh, for one thing, you can you hear me? This mic? Yeah, yeah it's okay. Um, a, it, you know, it, it's funny. Well, Sharin gave me that opportunity because she never rushed us. She never, you know, um, you know, she was really great. She was paying attention, and she allowed us to breathe life into those characters. And I would say one thing about Jean-Claude Carrier. Uh, there were times it was quite fun because I felt like I was in a Bunuel film or something with some of those scenes that were, you know, quite philosophical, the conversations between Mark and Alan. And, you know, and I think because he's a humanist in a lot of ways, as a writer, uh, the, the characters were very human. Uh, uh, you know, I think a lesser group of talented uh, writers would have kind of created a, an Alan that was a sort of, even though his name is villain, but a, uh, that type of a character more. And you know, Alan is a bit paradoxical in some ways. In one way, he's sort of the watchdog who's sort of, uh, you know, shadowing her every move as she's 
you know, inter sort of, in, you know, uh, intruding on these people's lives by recording their dreams. And on the other hand, he doesn't really care all that much. He's sort of, he's sort of philosophical. I mean, he's cynical in a certain way. And in that way, it's like, uh, it's a little more European, I think, in, in the attitude. So he is a little, yeah, of course, he's this kind of anti-intellectual American cowboy, but then there's this philosophical side to him. And, uh, and, uh, and, and that's what I really liked about it. I, that's what I liked about the script, and that's what I liked about the process of, of, of uh, making the film. I always thought it was a little bit like uh, Monty Hellman meets uh, Antonioni, you know? These two different worlds, one very American and then one with a different skewed view of that world, you know, or uh, like another movie. And that's why another reason, because Shirin is making movies or making a film that normally wouldn't get made by, uh, uh, without her. So it was, uh, you know, great to be able to do that. And we lost Monty Hellman, of course, in the last year as well. He's also... Uh, not with us anymore. Um, there were some lines in the script. I noticed that at one point he says, um, that he, she says he's, he's my bodyguard. And those of us who've followed Matt's career know that you made a film in 1980. A long time ago. <laughs> so were, were these little nods that you put in to sort of, you know... No, I had nothing to do with that. That was... Uh, no, that w had nothing... That was you came up with this song for the end. <laughs> yeah, well, I was kind of embarrassed listening to that one. I was saying... Well, that was to... The credit of you guys, you know, because when you make a film, you make it three times. You make it when you write it, right, which you were doing. Then you make it when you're filming it, and you make it when you're editing it. And in this case, in between takes, I, I was singing a song that was in my mind that I always loved by the Ink Spots called Someone's Rocking My Dream Boat. And then Shirin and Soja were like, hey, we really like that thing that you're doing. Could you do that in the take? And... So that was my debut singing in movies. Maybe it'll be my last. <laughs> but, but I have to add that this is the first time I've ever done any project in America. I've always only worked outside, and if, if the, the, the narratives, the concepts, always been related to Iran or the Middle East. So to come up with an idea that at once um, s sort of involved the narrative of this Iranian woman and her own haunting past, yet it was really mainly about America, it was a real challenge. Uh, and a script written by French uh, and two Iranians. Um, so uh, this is really, a, a film is a hybrid of what Paris, Texas would be to, you know, uh, to Bunuel and to Iranian cinema. Um, and the other thing is that, for me, the character of Simin was conflicted between these two characters, that one was very feminine, sort of the pretty boy, the romantic, the dreamer, that in a way identified with her because she was also like this dreamer, you know. Uh, and yet she felt more um, sort of attracted to him because he was the macho, he was the masculine that she was drawn to, like almost like, a, like the fatherly, but yet there's an attraction. So we were really interested in her being emotionally um, divided between these two men that ultimately she never had anything to do with uh, sexually, but the way she was attracted to both sides, you know? And, and that was a very conceptual approach to the story. And as I said, in the, the very beginning of the film, I couldn't, I was so close to the screen, I thought it was actually Matt lying on the, on the, the desert when it's actually the father. Because there, there are some similarities. Thank God she didn't ask me to do that. <laughs> um, maybe one last question that I'm going to ask before we hand it over. Here we are in Vienna, where some people have talked about dreams in the past. It's also many, many Iran Iranian people here. It's, it's, a, you know, it's 36 Very Iranian famous restaurant. people have talked about one or dreams. One, one or two. So I've got to ask, you know, did you go into... Freudian, Jungian stuff? Was, was there a Viennese touch in this, in this very American film? You know, I, I, I really have been asking myself, because I've made many videos and films that have had scenes of dreams, and I think what really happens, particularly in this last two years of during the pandemic, there's something about nightmares and dreams that are crosses, uh, they cross cultural boundaries, that we are truly naked and truthful in our dreams, and we that's where we face our fears. And I think in this film, 
uh, and the reason she sort of connects to people's dreams and she's obsessed with dreams of others is because they resonate her own nightmares and dreams. There is a universality about what we as people dream about, which is a projection of what we're anxious about, whether it's displacement, is disease, is abandonment, is violence, is war, um, you know, you know, all of these elements that it's disregarding whether you're Iranian, Austrian, American. So a film made about two countries that are opposite of each other, Iran and the US, yet having dreams to be this sort of link, it, it was a poetic element for me. And the last thing I want to say, there's something very beautiful for me, the relationship between photography and dreams. Because with photography, it's always about you know, I am a photographer. It's about capturing or freezing that single moment. But with dreams, they vanish immediately. We forget our dreams almost instantly. So there is this kind of paradox. And I, and I think the ending for me was about that. It's like what remains of us and what vanishes and what yet remains permanent. And there's, there's something very beautiful about this poetic relationship between dreams and photography that I've been really obsessed about. Somewhere between dreams and photography we have cinema, perhaps. <laughs> so this is a good chance to see uh, questions from the audience. We do have microphones which will come to you. Uh, the first hand I can see is sort of two rows in. Can the microphone identify the person? Yeah, the microphone is coming. Thank you very much for the movie. It was very touchy for me. I really felt it. Even though it didn't have any element from now, I wanted to ask you, was that on purpose to use all the past element and have the timing of the movie in near future? And what was the purpose where this idea came from? Thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, again, um, this film is very personal uh, for me. Um, which there has been a revolution that basically separated me from my country and you know my family and so there is the political history of this woman um, which you know has caused this incredible pain in her and not just her but you know a huge community of Iranians in diaspora to, that had left behind Iran, but yet also incarcerated in the US or in Europe, etc. So the, in some ways, the film is really hinting in the past of a lot of us Iranians that are living in exile, and yet looking into the future, um, which is the creation of America that is actually, it's, it's not just white people, it's all of us, you know. It's, it, and so in, in some ways, the film does go back into the past and into the future, you know, and, and she being sort of conflicted between her own personal history and past and what is to come in America, um, which is um, the surveillance in American, you know, government, et cetera. So, um, so the film goes between past and the future, America and Iran, and fanaticism on both ends. I don't know if I answered your question. Thank but you very much. Uh, the hand I see with the glasses and uh, red top. Yeah, microphone will come to you. There it is. Just to follow up on the fanaticism, there's a lot of religious um, imagery on in the, from the US, but not in the colony, not in the Iranian colony. Is that intentional? And also, is there a Smithson reference at the end with the spiral, the spiral of photos, spiral jetty in that landscape? Yeah, I, I think the idea of fanaticism uh, is something very important to us, that it exists as much in America as in Iran. In fact, the United States started to look more like Iran in the recent years. Um, and and the, the community of um, those Iranian colony that you saw, uh, were, they were militant. Um, uh, you know, of, of course, they were not, you know, realistic, but uh, they were typical of communities that were not necessarily religious, but they had been living for years and years hoping to overthrow the government. So there was an absurdity, but it was modeled according to some 
groups of I Iranians that are living in different parts of outside of Iran that are very political but are not religious. Um, but yes, religion was a big part of it, as you saw several times in the households. There were a lot of iconography and people who were extremely religious because I think that is a big aspect of American society today. Do you agree fanaticism is thriving in, or am I wrong as maybe you should speak? No, I mean, not in my house, but, or not with <laughs> my crowd, but um, yeah, I mean, it's always, I mean, especially the further you get into the heartland, yeah, there is a lot of it, extremism. And I don't know about how much of that's going on in, in Austria, throughout Europe, I think there's some of that everywhere. I think uh, it is interesting, though, the colony, well, I don't know, that, that, you know, I thought it was a very interesting, and I like that there's so much of it, I, there was something very germane to the American experience there, too, somehow, and these people that were sort of trapped in a time warp, but I think what I got from that was that this was a group of people that were not fanatical, that wanted a certain Iran that they were unable to to and that and that's still within them. And I I did believe that. Sometimes in even conversations with you and some of your friends and colleagues, I felt that it's still it's still very painful that uh, being exiled from your home. You know. I just want to add that I know many many Iranians living in Europe, United States, in their 60s, 70s that are very politically active and still, it, uh, they can never go back to Iran, but they're still working and me having meetings and discussing about how to overthrow the government. I think there's something really sort of absurd and funny about the obsessions of certain people who never give up regardless of their age and separation from the reality of what's going on in Iran, where they still feel that they can be involved. And so this was a bit of a parody on, on that. Well, you know, if I would just say also, to me, the film is very much a dream in that a lot of things aren't explained, and I like that, because dreams are, there is a logic in each person that has a dream, but it's not necessarily rational or uh, something that can be explained, you know, it, you know how we end up. It's, it, it's fragments of our lives that are disconnected like a collage or something, you know? And, uh, and that's one of the things that I liked in the film that was uh, not explained, you know? Not everything was explained. Uh, and was this why you yourself played the character female military general? I think you're, you're explaining with the triangle, this is you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I have to say that we tried hard to find other Iranian women in New Mexico to play that role. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm not sure if you noticed, but I was also one of the women with the red hair, and I was... There was a COVID <laughs> problem <laughs> getting I mean, everybody time, tested. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was really... <laughs> I played multiple great. roles. <laughs> I'm the it was worst a red actor. wig, right? It was a red wig. Yeah, I, 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 I'm the worst. I, but I really should emphasize that we great. made great. this film during the pandemic in New Mexico with very little money. I, I was very grateful that we had such amazing cast that trusted us and despite all the obstacles came and worked with us. Um, and that is a testimony to their artistry and belief in films that are challenging and are experimental and um, trying to be original, really. I think you definitely succeeded. I've got to ask, was Isabella Rossellini in lockdown? What was the deal with her? <laughs> Do I make my confession? Okay, so we got a call. I mean, this shouldn't go outside of this room, but there, there, there was... <laughs> Uh, just a few days before we were shooting her scene, she called in a panic and said, Shireen, with her Italian accent, oh, I have my, my children won't let me fly. And I was like, what? Like, I cannot come and really afraid. So um, we were in immediate crisis, um, and we had all the actors in place. And so there was a discussion about getting other actresses to um, replace her. And suddenly something went off on my brain that is like, <gasps> this is a very bonoir moment. There could be a dinner where the hostess is present on a Zoom or on TV <laughs> in a mental hospital. And, I love and the mental hospital yeah, part yes. of it. <laughs> to add to it. So we had to film that scene without her, with someone who sat there just... 
And then what's amazing about Isabella when we went to finally shoot her in Long Island, she was so incredibly intuitive and was able to, to interact and, and make own that scene. Because I just want to add that with this film, there are like six short stories. Each household is a short story and they have their own main characters. And of course, these three main characters went in and out. And she was the central in that scene. But it was amazing that she was able to not only own it, but also add to her character and be oh. very funny. Those laughters that I didn't oh. add. <laughs> So it was really um, a kind of a co um, accident that was a lucky accident, I think. And Matt's reaction shots were priceless, these little looks up and eye rolls. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I will say that I, I questioned your choice to not have the actress playing that role be present. And I, and I thought it really worked. It actually, I think it improved the scene. You know, it made it better. So it was a... It was a really bold choice, and and and, and, and for me it worked. I, I, for me it worked. It did, did, sorry, did you ever get to hang out with Isabella Rossellini? In the past, you know, we oh. met, but we didn't. We never really hung out. But we didn't hang out on this because she, she wasn't it was there. Was shot later, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but just the last thing is that. Um, after we finished uh, filming with Isabella, we made a little video for Jean Claude, who was really really ill and said how much we love him, and we sent him the video. Next, And he answered, I love you all, and he died the next day. Oh. And that was the, the saddest thing, that he died the day after we finished, actually finished filming the entire film. And Isabella was very, very uh, close friends with him as well. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yep, oh, the, hand, the forest of hand immediately goes up. The, 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 the microphone will come to the very tall person with the long arm. <laughs> there we are. Um, I would like to thank you for the film. I found it was very, very beautiful and very touching. And what, does, what I was wondering during watching at the pictures, where do they come from? Because there are a lot of pictures in this film, like family pictures and pictures in Martyr Hall, and pictures of people with their dreams, and yeah. Well, all the photographs you saw laid on the ground, I photographed those people. So those are my photographs, because I, I, as I said, I went to New Mexico for extended time, um, and I've created this you know, installation of 111 photographs. But um, we thought it was really important that, you know, with Simin being conflicted about her own history in Iran and then her American life. And at the end, the images of her family, which we collected from my family, Sheila, Rand's family, all over. Uh, and then suddenly, the, the images of the Americans and Iranians melted together, meaning that all these barriers, all these borders that she felt between being Iranian, being American, her own nightmares in the colony, and then the American nightmares that all sort of blurred together. So we collected very purposely images that I took of Americans with images of our own families. So they were all like our family. And then the martyrs room um, in the colony, um, there were actually activists who were executed by the government of Iran because they were political activists, uh, quite known to some people, and then mixed with it, my sister, my mother, my <laughs> niece, uh, so, so and so. So we just collected all these images of um, faces from the 60s and 70s and 50s. Um, so they were not really contemporary, but uh, almost every one of us has lost people of activism in Iran. Maybe some Iranian people know that. So it was really a tribute to people who lost their lives fighting for their country. Uh, yeah, who's next? Uh, just here, with the again with the glasses. Microphone is quite close to you, I think. Right here. Yeah, with the, the gentleman with glasses, and uh, yeah, if you could put your hand up again and wave it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I wanted to ask um, um, this this narrative of uh, civil servants uh, collecting dreams of citizens in the name of security. It reminded me of a book um, 
the balance of dreams and I read, I googled it a bit and I read like 10 years ago that you were gave interviews about considering making a, a movie out of that but it sounded like a different story and so I wanted to ask if this is, um, if there is a connection to the book by Ismail Kadade or if this will be another project. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm so glad <laughs> you you noticed that. Uh, Ismail Kadir wrote a book called Palace of Dreams, which was essentially is the state uh, government that on daily basis collects uh, people's dreams um, from different corners of the country, and they arrives with a carriage, and then there are different de departments: the reception, selection, interpretation, and they each. Um, have different floors and different colors of outfits. It's just so surreal. And, and the, the reason for that was fanaticism of the state, um, that they felt that God, uh, essentially, um, people's dreams project um, the future and calamities and issues that the government should know. So their whole obsession was to, to see what are people dreaming about. And I found that, well, that was the only pro main problem, there was not a single woman in that book. <laughs> it was all these men. Um, but uh, eventually uh, I thought, you know, when Trump came into power and we were dealing with this fanaticism of his government and the absurdity of this theater, that it was not unimaginable, just like Khamenei in Iran, that Trump or the government of the US would really try to spy on people's subconscious to understand what are people thinking about, what are people buying, what are people dreaming about, and that might infiltrate the corporations, the, the market, the, 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 the social mandates. And so to me, this idea that how the fanaticism that comes from governments could um, and the idea of spying in people's subconscious such a powerful idea that I don't think is un unforeseeable. I, I really think um, that if, in fact, we continue in the way that we were going in America, you will see that things will go in that direction. <laughs> and so. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, throughout the world, I mean, I think that. Uh, uh, I mean, with the way things are going, with social media and stuff, and the way that we get tracked, uh, with everything they want to know. It, they say it's for us, but is it really for us? I mean, that they want to know what your interests are, what you're interested in, and uh, they want to get all your information. And I think that is invasive. And of course, I mean, so that's the beginning of it. And I mean, I don't know. Artificial intelligence, uh, talking about that's but, but not that far around the corner, which I have a hard time believing, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I don't know if you noticed, the Census Bureau was uh, an integration of a corporate America with the governmental office, the bureaucratic office. So Nancy, in many ways, embodies someone very fancy and very progressive, where the staff was. So our idea was, like, Facebook, Twitter, and how they infiltrate, how they influence American government. So it's not unimaginable that in the future, who rules, it's actually a mix of um, the White House with the corporations. And that was really the idea of this film, that the Census Bureau was not just purely governmental, but it's something bigger and more frightening, which is very powerful force in America. Unfortunately, time is against us, as always, at film festivals. We have so many great films to show you. We have time for one last question, and the hand that I saw is over there. <laughs> How did you came up with, a, with all um, the dreams that were mentioned in the film? Have you ever tried to do that? So really come into a house of a person and ask about that, or it was your dreams, or it was... Give me your answer. <laughs> Actually, in 2019, when I went to photograph people and make the video, 
I went door to door to people's home and I would knock at the door and say, hi, I am an Iranian artist uh, from you know, New York here. I want to make a film um, about American people's dreams and I like to talk to you and interview, photograph you. And some people say, get lost. And some people would say, oh, come on in, you're Iranian. Is it? So I, I actually, I, I did what Simin did. I mean, not as like... As, as working for, but so the experience, and when I photographed those people, every subject, I asked, I interviewed them, I talked to them about who they were, but also if they remembered their last dreams. So these were uh, extensively recorded, and the video that I made very much does that. Um, but it was me going to people's home and asking if we could talk to them, film at their home, and if I could take their portrait. And eventually that was um, in the film, and that changed into something else, um, but essentially was the principal idea that my experience as an artist. <laughs>